No Batty Thursday is complete without the main event, the showstopper, the icon, the host of the Locked on Kings podcast, uh, and of course, anchor over at ABC 10, our man, uh, Matt George. Matt George, kind enough to come out uh, and hang out with us yesterday uh, at Fieldhouse on his lunch break. Man, tore himself away from work uh, to come spend some time with us. Great seeing Matt. Really was a tough decision. Hmm, work or go to a sports bar with a bunch of Kings fans and enjoy Kings basketball. Hmm, rough one. And, you, and the good stuff was you were there for the first half. It was really enjoyable in the first half. Yep, I left and everything went downhill. So apologies. No, thanks a lot. So man. now we know who to blame. We've been we we, we 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 talked about Keegan not shooting. Uh, we talked about Kyrie Irving in the fourth quarter. Uh, Christian Wood in the fourth quarter. It turns out, as usual, it was Matt George's fault. Get in, in line. Time. In time, anytime something goes wrong, we can blame Matt George. Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah, happy I to mean, do it. the timeline matches up, though. Matt <laughs> leaves and everything goes to hell. I think Matt left, Darren missed a dunk, <laughs> and then everything went to oh. hell. Yep. That's a, almost exactly what happened. I hopped in the car, and the first call that I heard G-Man call was Darren's missed dunk. I was like, okay. Any, uh, any, ta- any takeaways from last night? Other than the NBA r- referees were terrible. Oh. I mean, I to me... Like, it sucks that once again, for the upteenth time this season, and, and it has just happened with the Sacramento Kings. It's happened with so many different teams and so many different games this year, but you have to talk about the officials before you can talk about the game. And while Kyrie went absolutely supernova, had 19 in the fourth quarter, he just put on a shot-making masterclass, and it was very, very enjoyable to watch. And low-key, every Kings-Mavericks matchup this season has been a ton of fun. Like, that would have been a really, really fun playoff series between those two. But once again, we can't talk about that because we have to talk about the incompetence of the referees. Now, I I tried to make this perfectly clear on Locked on Kings and on social last night. The Kings didn't lose. Uh, uh, Dallas didn't win because of the referees. Mm -hmm. Of course, the referees had an impact. Dallas won because of Kyrie Irving. But the... The just the terrible officiating throughout that game for both sides, and then it comes to a climax at the end with Kevin Herter getting hit in the face, getting called for a foul, and basically the technical foul on, on Kevin Herter standing just because the referee had his feelings hurt, even though Luka Doncic has been crying and moaning all game long and doesn't get a technical foul. It's just It, it just speaks to impartial or rather um, uh, unfair treatment or preferential treatment in the league. It happens time and time and time and time again, and no matter how many people deny uh, how many people around the referee scene or I had a former referee on locked on Kings and talked to him. And he said that that doesn't exist. You see example after example, after example of treatment being different for the Sacramento Kings or any team compared to uh, a star. So, I mean, my main takeaway from last night was this great game. Kings couldn't afford to lose. Mavericks couldn't came down to the wire was very fun, was very entertaining. The NBA should be really, really concerned about their officiating come playoff time, because that's going to be put on a pedestal. It's going to be put under a spotlight uh, and it could change uh, narratives and change games uh, in a way that I don't think the NBA is ready to deal with or wants to deal with. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's going to be a concern because these guys are awful. And, we, and you talk about the Kevin Herter play. We talked about it a little bit. I mean, the guy gets a technical for yelling at a referee who made the wrong call. And once they go see it's the wrong call, the text still stands. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, – it, it, it really is a joke. But And then there's another play you need to review for 30 seconds later, the De'Aaron Fox it. play. Yeah. Yep. Now, but the, But the thing that – we talked about and what I'm sure Mike Brown is going to talk about with his team is he's got to, he's got to say, Hey, these things are going to happen. There's going to be bad calls. There's going to be bad officiating. You can't let that take you out of your game. You can't let that take you out of what you're trying to do. I saw it the other day in that OKC Warriors game where the refs messed up again, not letting Jalen Williams in and, and coach Mike D lost it. Absolutely lost it. And his team saw that and they, faltered i think because of his reaction to all that so you got to be able to stay poised you got to be able to stay locked in because the bad calls are coming and and to be honest to be fair you're probably going to get a couple bad calls too like in your favor so you got to stay consistent Uh it it might happen wow it might happen it's a take right there it might happen it might happen i mean they're just terrible they are terrible i mean the law of averages says it's bound to happen yeah but you got to be able to and the Kings have done a good job of this all season long. Just stay the course, man. Stay locked in. Stay focused on what you're trying to do. They never really get too high or too low. 
See, I 100% understand and, and, and agree with what you're saying, and I think everybody's going to say, even Mike Brown admitted that to the game last night. He was talking to the refs too much, which I disagree, Mike. I think you should have talked to him more to get them to hear your point like you've been trying to do all season long. But but regardless, I understand exactly what you're saying, Kenny. You're absolutely right. You can't game plan for how the officials are going to uh, officiate a game, and you can't let them get under their skin or under your skin. At the same time, though, if you're trying to execute your game plan and play your game and you got players getting hit in the face, which happens to demonstrate his bonus every single night, but it blatantly happens with a referee that is standing two feet away from the play on the sideline, and that has an impact on the play because it's called a, as a turnover, and then the technical foul gives that team a free point. I mean, that's one thing. And then, like you said, Damian, a couple minutes later, or really a couple possessions later, De'Aaron Fox is attacking the basket. At this point, the Kings are down like six points or something like that. They're they're less than a couple minutes remaining. They're trying to work their way back in. Like at the very very least that's a non call and you let the game play on and, and let everything play on and De'Aaron retains possession. And then we see what happens after that. But to call that a double dribble when clearly you had no clear view on the play to make that kind of call, like it, it's incompetence to a level to where even if you're not allowing it to get under your skin, it can have a direct impact on the game. The good news is this game didn't matter as much to the Sacramento Kings unless you really, really care about the second seed. But if this is game two and the Kings are down 0-1 in Sacramento against the Golden State Warriors and De'Aaron Fox is attacking the basket, Draymond Green hits him across the arm and is called for a double dribble and the Kings basically have their chance to come back, fly out the window, that could be the series. So... Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to see, and and referees are human. They make mistakes all the time. And I typically have more patience for referee mistakes uh, than than most people. But when they're compounded mistakes, one after another, after another, in key moments of games that have an effect on the, the outcome of a game. And on top of that, what I've seen more this year than any other year is referees imposing themselves into the game and allowing their emotions and their interactions to uh, affect their calls. Like, to me, it's inexcusable that Luca can do what he does all game long and Kevin Herter gets teed up for one interaction when Kevin was justified after being hit in the face. Like these, that human side of referees, which I don't necessarily blame them for, that can have a significant impact on a playoff game. And whether it goes in favor of the Kings or against the Sacramento Kings, it still should not happen. Matt, you mentioned this a, a, a second ago, and I'm curious how you feel. You, you, you said the game didn't have a lot of uh, consequence unless you really care about the second seed. Do you, do you, do you care if the Kings finish second or third? Not, not really. Um, cause I, I look at the really five through eight or whoever comes out of the play. And I look at, there's, there's reasons to think the Sacramento Kings can and will beat them. And there's a reasons, uh, reasons to think the Sacramento Kings won't beat them. Like you can make an argument for and against every single team. Uh, and it's not just creative radio banter. Like there are, the Sacramento Kings are unproven. And so are a lot of these other teams. And we're assuming that what the Kings have done in the regular season is going to carry into the playoffs. Just like we're assuming the history or the experience of a team like golden state or uh, Phoenix is going to carry into the playoffs. So it's really a massive coin flip. So to me, the difference between two and three isn't massive. The difference between five and six that's the biggest drop off because at five, you get the Phoenix suns at six, you get the Sacramento Kings and they're like what four or five teams that want that one six spot and probably don't want five that bad. There's no reason to get five. You still don't have home court advantage and you're taking on a team that I think should be the favorite coming out of the West. So to me, it doesn't matter where the, where the Kings end up. They're going to get a tough opponent that they shouldn't be afraid of that they can beat, but it's going to, it's going to take some soul searching at the same time. Matt, if the Kings and may, I'll ask you again when we talk again, probably because you know, you may have different evidence judging on if you know who they're playing. But if the Kings don't win in this first round, what do you think the reason is for it? Oof, I th I think there's a lot. Wow. So while um, you think about it, while you think my my the thing that I've always said is if the Kings don't win in the playoffs and don't win in the first round, it's not going to be because their defense was poor. It's going to be because they didn't hit shots. If this team hits shots, they can play defense the same exact way, and they'll beat pretty much everybody in the Western Conference. But if they're not hitting shots, that's when the defense does get exposed. If that's that's how I think they will lose. I agree with that. I'm going to build a branch off of that too. I'm going to, I'm going to say maybe the stage or the moment was a little bit bigger than they were prepared for, which kind of feeds into that shot making. And I, I talked about this a couple podcasts ago. Like 
the Kings have a really unique roster in the sense that there are seven guys that real, I think seven, maybe six, six or seven guys that realistically can go off at any given time. Like we've seen so many different guys score 30 points, 20 points. Malik went for 40. Uh, and of course, De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis uh, are as impactful and important as they are. This Kings team can beat you in so many ways and have consistently won with six or seven guys in double figures all season long that that's incredibly difficult to game plan for. Even if you're having a good game and maybe taking the ball out of De'Aaron Fox's hands, Kevin Herter could go off or Keegan Murray could catch fire. or Even Harrison Barnes can get going. So it's up to the Sacramento Kings to hit shots as a team. And you look at their last recent home uh, losses, right? The loss to the Minnesota Timberwolves when they could have clinched. The loss to the San Antonio Spurs. The Sacramento Kings haven't been shooting the ball well from the perimeter. I don't know if it's tired legs. I don't know. Whatever insert excuse here, it doesn't matter. If the Sacramento Kings, to your point, Kenny, aren't making shots in the postseason, they're in big trouble. Defensively, they're good enough to let their offense carry them. That should be the the best way to look at it. You're not going to win games because your defense, you may win quarters, you may win stretches, but offensively, that's how it's going to carry you. You just need your defense to be what it is and your offense to carry it. And if the Kings aren't making shots they're not going to beat anybody. And I think they know that. I don't think the moment's going to be an issue. I don't either. You, you you mentioned that at the start, like the moment being so big could affect shot making. I don't think that's something that's going to happen. I think defense could affect shot making. I think shot making could affect shot making. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think the moment's going to be a thing for this group, particularly in the first round. We get to the second or the third or further, like, Okay, maybe you get, you get me there. But the first round of the playoffs, I don't I don't think that's going to happen. Here's what I, I'm think, a little... I, think, I think it could happen for like four or five minutes to start a game. Mm. I don't think it's going to happen for a, a, a 48 minute stretch. Yeah, that's a good or, point. Or games. Especially starting a game. That's a that's a really good point, too. The reason why I have that concern is what Mike Brown talked about after the San Antonio Spurs loss, which is this team goes into home games and they feed off of that environment and it has an impact on their offense, but clearly doesn't have an impact on their defense. The way the Sacramento Kings play at home, according to Mike Brown, they almost expect their offense to be good and to feed off of that energy. So they don't need to play as hard defensively. So that's why I'm a little concerned about the moment you get to that game one. That's an atmosphere unlike any other in the league Sacramento. I mean, it's going to rival probably the, the, uh, the rattle Seattle series and that moment, like there, there's going to be an, a unique injury or energy in that arena. How do the Sacramento Kings respond to that? Do they not allow it to change their focus? Do they focus in on both ends of the floor and play the, their basketball game? Or do they try and feed off of that crowd to a way uh, or to a level that impacts their offense positively, but maybe negatively impacts their defense because they expect kind of that wave of energy to carry them? The fact that we've had to talk about that and question that as recent as the last home game, the second to last home game of the season. That's why I'm a little bit worried about that aspect of, of the moment. Okay. Um, has, as what we, you, what we've seen this week, has that affected uh, what you think this team is capable of or not capable of in, in the playoffs. And what I mean by that is the home loss, giving up 142 to the Spurs on Sunday, then rebounding and playing as well as they did against new Orleans. And then last night, you know, a guy like Kyrie Irving, everybody in the playoff has a guy like Kyrie Irving that could take over a game like that. Those three things combined. Has that kind of um, shifted any of your thoughts about the Kings going into the playoffs? No, because I know for a fact that in all three of those games, the Kings had chances to win and they weren't playing nearly their best basketball. Like we've seen them play far better than in a lot of these games. We've seen them play far better than in the two Portland games and they won both those games comfortably. Like uh, there's still another level that I've seen this team get to maybe even a level beyond that, that they might not get to this year. That might be a year down the road that Mike Brown needs an off season and the Kings need a little bit of some roster tweaks to get to that level. But I'm not concerned. I, really, truly, I'm not concerned about anything beyond the Kings ability to take advantage of home court advantage, because depending upon your matchup, like, Basically, what I've seen from the Kings on the road this season is that this team is capable of winning a big game on the road. I don't think they're capable of winning a series on the road. And what I mean by that is if they go down uh, 0-2 at home or 1-1 at home, I believe they're good enough to get one or maybe maximum two road games to even that back up. But I don't think they're going to win all three on the road to be able to secure a series in, in seven games or in six games. I just don't think that they're good enough 
to be able to say that despite how well they've played on the road this season. You take on a team like Golden State, who is awful on the road, and you drop a game or drop two games in your own building and expect to catch the Warriors for one or two games when they are unbelievably talented and unbelievably good inside of the Chase Center, that's where I'm concerned a little bit. You've worked hard all regular season long to get this home court advantage. You've shown you can win a game or two on the road, and you've proven that. However, you need to protect your home floor if you're going to make it not just out of the first round, if you're going to make it as deep as the team expects for them to go and holding them to team expectations, they need to play a lot better in in the Golden One Center. Matt uh, saying that reminded me of that weird quirk of a series that was uh, Mavericks Clippers a couple years ago. So where the the road road team team won every (laughs) except for game seven, Mm -hmm. the road team won every game. That was bizarre. Do you have a favorite in the, we were kind of doing this exercise earlier and it's really, really difficult in the West, but if I put you on the spot, give me a a power rankings of two of the two teams you think who could realistically come out of the Western conference. Phoenix suns and I want to believe in Denver because I like Mike Malone, but I just, don't I still don't okay I'm gonna I'll do Phoenix Suns and Los Angeles Clippers those are my two Clippers. okay but funny enough I thought you were going to ask me which team out of the group that I would want the Sacramento Kings to play in the first round realistically and the answer is also the Los Angeles Clippers because I think the Kings match up really well against the Clippers they've played really well against the Clippers all season long so out of the Lakers Clippers and Warriors I want the Clippers out of those three but well, there's the Paul George thing too we don't have to like pretend like that's not part of the, the, the thing like he, I don't think he's I don't think he's playing in the first round yeah I agree if he plays at all yeah yeah and even if he were to play in the first round I mean that's just coming off he's, the he's, he's, yeah like he's, he's not, uh it's almost like acclimated. I talk about with Andrew Wiggins. Yeah, I, you know, except it's a, probably a physical ailment with with Paul George more. Mark Wong just tagged us in a tweet. I don't think Zion Williamson is coming back. They didn't say anything negative. Mm-hmm. They just said we're going to continue to monitor his rehab and regimen, and that's it. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, this dude isn't. This dude's not coming back to play basketball. No, which is a shame. Like it that. Is. That sucks for it for is. basketball, but. Yeah. Man, it's, it's it's etching it's 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 inching into scary territory mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to Zion and his availability. Um, we both we both like the Suns uh, in 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 terms of that conversation. We all ranked um, the top three teams or who we believe could, the, the top three teams likely to come out because we found so many flaws in everybody, including Sacramento. And all three of us had Sacramento second. Uh, we didn't all have the same top team. Uh, but we all had Sacramento. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and it, it's not, Oh, Sacramento's so great. They're, 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 they're bordering on unbeat. It's w- w- when we, it was an exercise of weighing flaws. Mm. It was an exercise of weighing like pros and cons. And with Sacramento's ability to score, I feel like that's one of the most impressive things in the entire conference. And when you take all of the flaws of the other teams, it's also interesting. Four of us now, no one mentioned Memphis. Mm -hmm. No one's buying Memphis. We all are trying to convince ourselves Denver, except for me. I'm not. Mm -hmm. You and Jesse, uh, the the, the three of you tried a little bit, but no one's no one's sold on Denver. No one's sold on Memphis. I'm going to. I'm going to do my best Will Z impression here because these are these are always dangerous. It's always dangerous. Man man is sharp. He, he is so, and I don't, I'm sure his grades were way better than mine in all facets of education. But um, like, I, I looked at the numbers of, because people are talking about how the Kings defense is going to be such a deterrent uh, for them in the, in, in the, in the playoffs, or it's going to be really their pitfall. And it's going to be so bad as if the majority of defenses in the Western conference also aren't that bad. And really, if you're looking at, when you're looking at the worst defenses in the league, in terms of points per game allowed, the Sacramento Kings were, or around like 26 or something like that at 118 points per game allowed. So what I did is I, I looked at four the four best teams in the West defensively, and I looked at what the Sacramento Kings did 
against them. Like, for example, the Phoenix Suns are fourth in the league, the fourth best team in the league in terms of points per game allowed. They give up 111.7 points per game. The Sacramento Kings have played them four times. In those four games, they've averaged 122.2 points per game against the Phoenix Suns in those four games. If those were just the numbers, Phoenix would be 29th in the NBA in defense. Mm. And then you, I mean, you could keep going down the list. The Grizzlies, who are ninth in the league defensively, the Kings put up 116 points per game on them, which would be 18th in the league. The Clippers, even if you take out the uh, the the pl- or the overtime, 175. If you just look at a regulation, which was 153, the Kings put up 128.2 points per game against the Clippers this season in four games. That would put the Clippers not just in last, in dead last by like a margin of six. So any, anybody who wants to say the Kings defense is going to hold them back and not talk about how the offense can destroy these best defenses in the Western Conference, I think you're missing something there, which kind of feeds into your point, D'Lo, about why this team can't come out of the West. If the Kings offense is playing as well as it historically is capable of, according to the numbers, it's turning the best defenses in this conference into, into middle of the pack at best, most of them the worst. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing about that, there, well, actually, there's two things about that. Number one, they played a team the other day in the Pelicans who were playing as good as defense as anybody in the league over the past two three weeks. This team it turned a corner. It was seven and one. I, I think in that time, the only loss was blowing a twenty point lead to the Warriors. Um, I think they were rate they they were like the, the fifth rated defense in that time, and. The Kings easily put up what 121 on the head. They put up 121 on the head, and they went. They started the game like two of 14 from beyond the arc. You know what I mean? Like that's what this team does on the offensive end, and that's why I said Matt because Damian was talking about you now everybody on all these shows talking about if the Lakers do this, if the Warriors get this back, if Phoenix gets this. Everybody got an if except for the Kings. I'll come up with the Kings if if nobody slows them down defensively for what they've done this year in the regular season, they're not losing. Not in the Western Conference. You better hope. Well, we did we did the math before. I did the math where, I, I you know, the, the short order math, where typically whatever somebody's averaging in the regular season, take about five to six points off of that, and you get, you know, the playoff average. That's, that's usually it goes down five to six points. If they don't get them down five to six points, the Kings ain't, the Kings ain't losing. And I'll take it a step further. They're probably going to have to get the Kings down eight or nine points because if you get five to six points, they still like 115. That's their bread and butter. They still cooking in that one. If they don't stop the Kings from scoring, nobody's beating them. And Casey, let's take it even further than that because you hear about, oh, how are the Sacramento Kings going to beat the Golden State Warriors full t- four times? How are the Sacramento Kings going to beat this team four times? How are teams going to stop Sacramento's offense three to four times in order to win a series? Because mm-hmm. Mike Brown has also shown a tremendous ability for this team to make adjustments game in and game out. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're probably going to catch... The Kings are going to have one game in the playoffs where offensively they're not playing their best, and they're probably going to lose that game. Day off, come back the next day, or a couple days off for travel, or whatever it may be, I expect the Sacramento Kings to be a lot better. They've bounced back in big games when they've had to all season long. And you can't just disregard everything in the regular season and throw it out just by simply saying the playoffs are a different animal because Mm -hmm. what the hell is the point of the regular season at that point too? You're basically saying nothing matters in the regular season. So all the things from this regular season to argue in favor of the Kings opponent don't matter either. So Sacramento has shown an ability to adjust. If the Golden State Warriors or whatever team comes out and holds the Kings to 115 points in game one, game two, I expect the Kings to drop 125 on them. That's what they've shown they're they're able to do all season long. That should be the expectation in the postseason, too. Yeah, and real quick, look what we're talking about. Look at that Minnesota game where they could have clinched. We talk about how bad they were and how how bad they shot the ball. They put up 115. Yeah. In a in a god awful offensive performance, yeah. they put up 115. Yeah. And they what had a chance to win. They had a chance to win a game with five made threes in the modern NBA. Oh, that's wild. That number is so crazy. At five made threes, and they put up 115. This offense is prolific. Prolific. And, and, and the rest of the rest of the NBA going to see that in the playoffs. And like I was saying, man, how do you game first plan? Time. He's going to be seeing this team play for the first time. It's going to be an exciting day for a lot of the national media, Matt. How do you game plan for an offense that has so many people that can beat you? 
Like you try and take De'Aaron Fox or DeMontis Sabonis away. Yeah, that definitely handicaps this team. But there are so many players on this roster that can get hot and go off at any given time, including guy seven coming off the bench and Trey Lyles, who could put up 20 off the bench if he needs to. Like, it's not just slowing down the Kings offensively. It's stopping almost everybody or hoping that they have off shooting nights. That's a that's a that's a good segue into this question. Why did your rookie not shoot in the second half yesterday? Oh man. He was zero for zero. Oh, okay, hold on. Don't don't be putting that on me now. It's because I left. I told you. Like Keegan knew well, I left. Keegan, Keegan knew you were gone. And yeah, Keegan uh a, a, a fine first half. Now, in 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 defense, a little bit of Keegan Murray, I I I worded that that remark a little bit sarcastically in defense of Keegan Murray. The King scored 71 freaking points in the first half and then 48. It was obviously a drastically different uh, second half of them. And we remarked, you know, as we were watching in the field house, I, the Mavericks playing defense? The hell is going on here? They, in fact, were, and I credit them for that. It wasn't until after the game was over that I realized Keegan didn't have a single shot attempt in the second half. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have an explanation or an excuse for that. Um, I mean, even if you're cooled down in the second half, you still should be putting up shots, especially when you're as hot as you were in the first half. And even if I want to give credit to the Dallas Mavericks defense, there's nobody defensively on the Dallas Mavericks good enough to take Keegan Murray completely out of the game, especially with how many weapons the Sacramento Kings have in De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis. I look at that more as a Kings issue than I look at it a Keegan Murray issue, but Keegan also needs to recognize, hey, I got the hot hand tonight. We need some buckets. We need some points. We need to space the floor a little bit better to get some room for De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis. So I got to start calling for the ball a little bit and, and, him not taking a shot suggests that he wasn't trying to at least assert himself. That's where I hold him accountable in that sense. But the Kings also have to do a better job of recognizing, hey, he was going early on. We got to get our guy involved a little bit. Was he in in the final stretch? Because Davion was in. Was Because yeah, Davion, Davion was in and I think missed a, was in too. A, a three by 47 feet. Yeah. It got, but the Kings got the offensive rebound, and then De'Aaron missed one by 30. Mm. That was... Damn, that was unfortunate. Yikes! I think that would have cut the lead to one. Yeah, two. Yeah, one, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, it was yeah. tough. No, we were ready to pop for Davion's three. We, we really were. We were like, yeah, yeah, we got time because they got a steal. Yeah, they got yeah. a steal at that yeah. point, and it didn't happen. It didn't but happen. I, I put great a, look, a really good look. Both of them yeah, yeah. Uh, I put I put some of that on a lot of that. The majority of that on Keegan, man. Like you can't be aggressive. You can't go to the whole half without getting a shot. And even if they're not running something for you. Uh, Man, run the floor uh, hard on a, um, you know, on a turnover or uh, getting the defensive rebound, sprint the floor, try and fill the lanes that way, get an early layup or, you know, get on the offensive boards at some point and, and, and get a bucket that way. Be too good, too important to have no shot attempts. Yep. I hear that. Yeah, got to be better. Boils down to Kyrie Irving was otherworldly last he night. He really was. It's frustrating, uh, but he was. Uh, there were shots that he hit that Davion Mitchell couldn't have done anything different mm. on on Kyrie Irving on some of those plays. The shot that he hit in the corner is one of the dumbest oh. shots in the history of the NBA. Oh. If that shot happened in the playoffs, it would be played forever. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> just absolutely ridiculous. Nasty. I think a lot of this is hater Matt coming out, but I'll, uh -oh. I, I've watching the Dallas Mavericks this year and I haven't watched them that much, but especially, especially every single time they've played the Kings, the Dallas Mavericks have looked a lot better with Kyrie Irving in control than they've looked with Luka Doncic. Oh, that's oh, not hater. That's, that's, just that's, that's analyst, Matt George. That's yeah. not hating at all. And I'm like, I Sing don't your song. like, you sing your song. It <laughs> might finally be true after all of these years. I do. You, nailed it. you are ahead of your time, sir. I don't like watching Luka Doncic, which is a pretty common theme for most people I'm recognizing watching Luka Doncic. But yeah. the way the Dallas Mavericks play basketball, not just when Kyrie's cooking, but when Kyrie is out there getting the team involved is significantly different. And you talk about Kyrie hitting those crazy shots. The Kings shouldn't even had a, a chance to have a Davion three to cut it to within one. The only reason they did is because Luka decided to take a three-pointer with 13 seconds on the shot clock because he was open and he missed the shot and then fouled De'Aaron Fox the next trip up the floor and gave him an and one. That was so, so thirsty. That was so he thirsty. He only took two shots the whole quarter, and those that was one of them. <laughs> that was so thirsty. I got to get mine. <laughs> it's amazing. I need my moment. <laughs> Too much Kyrie talk. Too much Kyrie talk. I need my moment. <laughs> well, we've been your uh, Dallas sports leader for the last two days here. So 
we'll just ask the host of the Locked On Mavericks podcast to kind of fit the theme of the last two days. <laughs> and this is a team that, and, and credit to Dallas, they're 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 fighting for their life. Some some argue they should just die and keep that draft pick, but that's not the approach that they're taking. Clearly, by what we saw last night, they're fighting to make the play in. They have a brutal off season ahead of them, regardless of what happens. How would you fix the Dallas Mavericks? I mean, you've already step one was already wrong with Mark Cuban committing to to Jason Kidd as your head coach going forward. Yeah. So you're yeah. over one already to start your off season. It hasn't even started yet. I I don't. Here's the thing. I don't know if you can trade Luka Doncic because you're never going to get equal value back. And Luka is equal value. You need players who you need to surround Kyrie Irving with players who can score, defend, and you need that. It, someone would do it. It's mm -hmm. it's a Kevin Durant level haul mm -hmm. of draft picks. You get draft picks and a Michael Bridges type player. And again, don't don't misconstrue what we're talking about. This isn't an is not an indictment of Luka Doncic, the player how talented he is. He's only 24. It's There is no path for the Dallas Mavericks to get better. None, except for signing Kyrie Irving and trading Luka Doncic. It's the only one. I, I think you're right. I mean, the only thing going in favor of, of Luka over Kyrie is you at least have Luka under contract. Kyrie, you don't. And Kyrie's not necessarily been the most committed to any organization period over the course of his yeah. career, which would scare me too. But yeah. you're right. The best way to improve the organization is by doing exactly what you said. But also, I don't think that they're really willing to give up based off of one year after this team. Granted, I didn't think they belonged there, but credit to them. They got to the Western Conference Finals. So they ha they make they overachieved this year. They've clearly underachieved. I'm probably giving it one more year with Luka and hopefully bringing Kyrie back to see what a full season of them can do and trying to just add mm. something other than Tim Hardaway Jr. to help that that roster. But I, I feel like I'm making that move knowing that it's likely going to fail and I'm in potentially an even worse spot next offseason. But that's probably well, what I did. Well, the whole thing is, like, you're not, you can't make the move. Like, that's what you should do, but you can't do it. The one thing that you should do that you can do is you probably should have lost by 30 last night mm. and kept that draft pick because that was – the. Look second way that you can improve is if you had that top 10 draft pick you're not gonna have that that's now. a marginal improvement well a top 10 player but I mean, it's you you can you can get it, you a player there you can get no for somebody. sure but, but, but it's a player it. it's it's one it's, it's it's the king's conversation we were having this year yeah it's one yeah it's well, a yeah, player no you need assets. more than one yeah or you could yeah. trade that Pick. Well, that's that's what that. I mean yeah yeah you you you'd have to find it maybe that that maybe that turns into your biggest asset uh, that you have uh, join uh, D'Lo and KC along with Matt George live from Texas stadium uh, <laughs> for our next uh, watch party uh, as we have just given an insane amount of your attention thoughts on Dak Prescott, Matt, an insane amount of coverage to uh, uh, Dallas sports here uh, the last couple of days. Do you have a preference? I, I, do, I don't think we asked this. Do you have a preference of who they play? Yeah, it's Clippers. Oh, the Clippers. Yeah, you did yeah, say that. It's yeah. the Clippers. I mean, I, I would love the narrative of, of Kings Lakers. I'll tell you why I'm afraid of the Lakers and it's not Anthony Davis and it's not LeBron James. It's D'Angelo Russell. D'Angelo Russell is the reason why I'm, I'm scared of the <laughs> Los Angeles Lakers. Nightmares. Yeah. D'Angelo yeah. Russell torches yeah. Sacramento every yeah. single time. So I'm more nervous about that. Um, Davion Mitchell starting in these, this postseason. <laughs> I, he seems I think to be shadowing D'Angelo Russell. <laughs> I think every single series has a reason to be terrifying and every single series has a reason to be extremely exciting. And I'm not, I'm not one to worry or care about Lakers fans or Warriors fans being in the building because Kings fans are going to be in the building too, when they go to crypto.com arena or, or chase center or whatever it is. So if that's what we get, we're going to get a California battle more than likely. If that's what we get, I'm all for it. Sacramento has been King of the Pacific division of the Kings of California right now. And I expect them to, play no, like they getting, expect to get a California battle no matter what I would yeah, think I right I think so too hey look there's a lot of money in the Bay Area and and and, and in LA but damn <laughs> them prices look crazy hey, so we'll <laughs> say that I'll I'll, I'll I'll say crazy. this again don't be shamed if somebody from San Francisco wants to buy your ticket for eight times what you paid for it you're uh, welcome well, to sell it well look I, I, 
Do what you got to do. I know they do. make a lot of money out there, but damn. <laughs> damn. You they, got them in front get, of you? Huh? You got the ticket? You got ticket I just price? remember what it was. I think what get in the door price is like $400. Hmm. Get in the door? Yes. Mm-hmm. Jeez. On the resale, on the resale market, I don't know if single game tickets are going to be like that, but well, they're going to go so fast and get thrown back out there, and the, people don't even buy tickets to go to events anymore. It's a hustle. They, they, yeah, they buy them to it's resell like them. It's it's exactly like shoes. It is a hundred percent like shoes, and as a shoe connoisseur, that's offensive. <laughs> Matt, what's your favorite shoe? Uh, I I don't. I'm not a shoe head. I'm not a shoe. I, anything like head. Yep. Yeah, you sneakerhead. Sneakerhead. Hey. Don't laugh at me. Don't leave me alone. Okay. <laughs> Matt, we love you, man. ABC Ten got some things planned for the playoffs. Oh, uh, we're covering it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's great. That's all you can hope. That. That's all you can hope for from your local uh, <laughs> television broadcast. Matt Matt George really selling the hell out of ABC Ten hey, right come there. Come to ABC Ten. <laughs> For shoe heads and Kings coverage. That's what you get. There, there you go. Uh, uh, Kings coverage is only uh, Matt George uh, can bring you. Make sure you check out uh, the Locked on Kings podcast available wherever you get podcasts.